Ibn Kolder N. was a North African Muslim historiographer and historian, regarded to be among the founding fathers of modern sociology, historiography, demography, and economics. He is best known for his book, The Mukaddima. The book influenced 17th century Ottoman historians like a currency Ulja Khalifah and Mustafa Neymar, who used the theories in the book to analyze the growth and decline of the Ottoman Empire. 19th century European scholars also acknowledged the significance of the book and considered Ibn Khaldun as one of the greatest philosophers of the Middle Ages. Biography Ibn Khaldun's life is relatively well documented, as he wrote an autobiography in which numerous documents regarding his life are quoted word for word. Generally known as Ibn Khaldun N. after a remote ancestor, he was born in Tunis in AD 1332 into an upper class Andalusian family of Arab descent the Barna Calder N. His family, which held many high offices in Andalusia, had emigrated to Tunisia after the fall of Seville to the Reconquista in AD 1248. Under the Tunisian Hafsid dynasty some of his family held political office. Ibn Calder N.'s father and grandfather however withdrew from political life and joined a mystical order. His brother, Yahya Khaldun, was also a historian who wrote a book on the Abd al wadid dynasty. And who was assassinated by a rival for being the official historiographer of the court. In his autobiography, Khaldun traces his descent back to the time of Muhammad through an Arab tribe from Yemen, specifically the Hajramaut, which came to the Iberian Peninsula in the 8th century at the beginning of the Islamic conquest. In his own words, and our ancestry is from Hajramaut, from the Arabs of Yemen, by Awal ibn Hajar, from the best of the Arabs, well known and respected. However, the biographer Muhammad Enam questions his claim, suggesting that his family may have been mere ladies who pretended to be of Arab origin in order to gain social status. Enam also mentions a well-documented past tradition, concerning certain Berber groups, whereby they delusively aggrandize themselves with some Arab ancestry. The motive of such an invention was always the desire for political and societal ascendancy. Some speculate this of the Khaldun family. They elaborate that Ibn Khaldun himself was the product of the same Berber ancestry as the native majority of his birthplace. A point congenial to this posits that Ibn Khaldun's unusual written focus on, and admiration for Berbers reveals a deference towards them that is born of a vested interest in preserving them in the realm of conscious history. Such is that which the true Arabs of his day would find no enthusiasm for and indeed a vested interest in suppressing. Moreover the special position that he affords Berbers in his work is fully vindicated upon comparing it with his vitriolic attitudes towards the Arab, and his relative lack of interest in the state of affairs outside the Mab. In contrast, Muhammad Hosian chooses to believe, the false, Berber identity would be valid however at the time that Ibn Khaldun's ancestors left Andalusia and moved to Tunisia they did not change their claim to Arab ancestry. Even in the times when Berbers were ruling in al andlus the reigns of Almoravids and Almohads, the Ibn Khaldun's did not reclaim their Berber heritage. Equals education equals, his family's high rank enabled Ibn Khaldun to study with the best teachers in Manab. He received a classical Islamic education, studying the Quran which he memorized by heart, Arabic linguistics, the basis for an understanding of the Quran, Hadith, Sharia and Fiqh. He received certification for all these subjects. The mathematician and philosopher, al Abulai of Tlemcen, introduced him to mathematics, logic and philosophy, where he above all studied the works of Averroes, Avicenna, Razi and Tassi. At the age of 17, Ibn Khaldun N. lost both his parents to the Black Death, an intercontinental epidemic of the plague that hit Tunis in 1348 to Euro 1349. Following family tradition, Ibn Khaldun N strove for a political career. In the face of a tumultuous political situation in North Africa, this required a high degree of skill developing and dropping alliances prudently, to avoid falling with the short-lived regimes of the time. Ibn Khaldun N's autobiography is the story of an adventure, in which he spends time in prison, reaches the highest offices and falls again into exile. Equals early years in Tunis, Fez, Tlemcen and Granada equals. At the age of 20, he began his political career at the Chancellery of the Tunisian ruler Ibn Tafrikin with the position of Khatib al-Alamar, 
which consisted of writing in fine calligraphy the typical introductory notes of official documents. In 1352, Abbas the Sultan of Constantine, marched on Tunis and defeated it. Ibn Khaldun, n, in any case unhappy with his respected but politically meaningless position, followed his teacher Abilite Fez. Here the Marinid Sultan Abiyan and Fez I appointed him as a writer of royal proclamations, which didn't prevent Ibn Khaldun n from scheming against his employer. In 1357 this brought the 25-year-old a 22-month prison sentence. Upon the death of Abiyanan in 1358, the vizier al Hassan ibn Umar granted him freedom and reinstated him in his rank and offices. Ibn Khaldun then schemed against Abiyanan's successor, Abbas Salem Ibrahim III, with Abbas Salem's exiled uncle, Abbas Salem. When Abbas Salem came to power, he gave Ibn Khaldun a ministerial position, the first position which corresponded with Ibn Khaldun's ambitions. The treatment Ibn Khaldun received after the fall of Abbas Salem through Ibn Amari Abdullah, a friend of Ibn Khaldun's, was not to his liking, he received no significant official position. At the same time, Amar successfully prevented Ibn Khaldun a Euro, whose political skills he was well aware of a Euro from allying with the ABD al Wadids in Tlemcen. Ibn Khaldun therefore decided to move to Granada. He could be sure of a positive welcome there. Since at first he had helped the Sultan of Granada, the Nazarite Muhammad V, regain power from his temporary exile. In 1364, Muhammad entrusted him with a diplomatic mission to the King of Castile, Pedro the Cruel, to endorse a peace treaty. Ibn Khaldun successfully carried out this mission, and politely declined Pedro's offer to remain at his court and have his family's Spanish possessions returned to him. In Granada, Ibn Khaldun quickly came into competition with Muhammad's vizier, Ibn al-Khattib, who saw the close relationship between Muhammad and Ibn Khaldun with increasing mistrust. Ibn Khaldun tried to shape the young Muhammad into his ideal of a wise ruler, an enterprise which Ibn al-Khattib thought foolish and a danger to peace in the country a euro, and history proved him right. At al-Khattib's instigation, Ibn Khaldun was eventually sent back to North Africa. Al-Khattib himself was later accused by Muhammad of having unorthodox philosophical views, and murdered, despite an attempt by Ibn Khaldun to intercede on behalf of his old rival. In his autobiography, Ibn Khaldun tells us little about his conflict with Ibn al-Khattib and the reasons for his departure. The Orientalist Musin Mahdi interprets this as showing that Ibn Khaldun later realized that he had completely misjudged Muhammad v. back in Africa, the Hafzid Sultan of Bugi. Abba e Abdul H. received him with great enthusiasm, and made Ibn Khaldun his prime minister. During this period, Ibn Khaldun carried out a daring mission to collect taxes among the local Berber tribes. After the death of Abba e Abdul H. in 1366, Ibn Khaldun changed sides once again and allied himself with the Sultan of Tlemcen, Abba el Abbas. A few years later, he was taken prisoner by Abu Faris Abdul Aziz who had defeated the Sultan of Tlemcen and seized the throne. He then entered a monastic establishment, and occupied himself with scholastic duties, until in 1370 he was sent for to Tlemcen by the new Sultan. After the death of Eabdu el Azazed, he resided at Fez, enjoying the patronage and confidence of the regent. Ibn Khaldun's political skills, above all his good relationship with the wild Berber tribes, were in high demand among the North African rulers whereas he himself began to tire of politics and constant switching of allegiances. In 1375, sent by Abba Hamu, the Yabdu el Wadid Sultan of Tlemcen, on a mission to the Dawadid Arabs tribes of Biskra. After his return to the west Ibn Khaldun sought refuge with one of the Berber tribes, in the west of Algeria, in the town of Khalid ibn Salama. He lived there for over three years under their protection, taking advantage of his seclusion to write the Mukaddimah Prol Gumna, the introduction to his plan History of the World. In Ibn Salama, however, he lacked the necessary texts to complete the work. As a result, in 1378, he returned to his native Tunis, which in the meantime had been conquered by Abba el Abbas, who took Ibn Khaldun back into his service. There he devoted himself almost exclusively to his studies and completed his History of the World. His relationship with Abba el Abbas remained strained, as the latter questioned his loyalty. 
This was brought into sharp contrast after Ibn Calder N presented him with a copy of the completed history omitting the usual panegyric to the ruler. Under pretense of going on the Hajj to Mecca Euro something a Muslim ruler could not simply refuse permission for a Euro Ibn Calder N was able to leave Tunis and sail to Alexandria. Equals last years in Egypt equals. Ibn Khaldun said of Egypt, he who has not seen it does not know the power of Islam. While other Islamic regions had to cope with border wars and inner strife, under the Mamluks Egypt experienced a period of economic prosperity and high culture. However, even in Egypt, where Ibn Khaldun N lived out his days, he could not stay out of politics completely. In 1384 the Egyptian Sultan, al-Malik al-Tahir Barkuk, made him professor of the Kamiya Madraza and Grand Qadi of the Maliki school of FIQH. His efforts at reform encountered resistance, however, and within a year he had to resign his judgeship. A contributory factor to his decision to resign may have been the heavy personal blow that struck him in 1384, when a ship carrying his wife and children sank off the coast of Alexandria. Ibn Khaldun now decided to complete the pilgrimage to Mecca after all. After his return in May 1388, Ibn Khaldun N concentrated more strongly on a purely educational function at various Cairo madrasas. At court he fell out of favor for a time, as during revolts against Barkuk he had a euro apparently under duress a euro together with other Cairo jurists issued a fatwa against Barkuk. Later relations with Barkuk returned to normal, and he was once again named the Maliki Qadi. Altogether he was called six times to this high office, which for various reasons he never held long. In 1401, under Barkuk's successor, his son Faraj, Ibn Khaldun N took part in a military campaign against the Mongol conqueror Timur, who besieged Damascus. Ibn Khaldun N cast doubt upon the viability of the venture and didn't really want to leave Egypt. His doubts were vindicated, as the young and inexperienced Faraj, concerned about a revolt in Egypt, left his army to its own devices in Syria and hurried home. Ibn Khaldun N remained at the besieged city for seven weeks, being lowered over the city wall by ropes in order to negotiate with Timur, in a historic series of meetings which he reports extensively in his autobiography. Timur questioned him in detail about conditions in the lands of the Mab. At his request, Ibn Khaldun N even wrote a long report about it. As he recognized the intentions behind this, he did not hesitate, on his return to Egypt, to compose an equally extensive report on the history of the Tatars, together with a character study of Timur, sending these to the Marinid rulers in Fez. Ibn Khaldun N spent the following five years in Cairo completing his autobiography and his history of the world and acting as teacher and judge. During this time, he is alleged to have joined an underground party named Rigel Hawa Rigel. Their reform-oriented ideals attracted the attention of local political authorities and the elderly Ibn Khaldun was placed under arrest. He died on March 19, 1406, one month after his sixth selection for the office of the Maliki Qadi. Works Ibn Khaldun N has left behind few works other than his History of the World, Kitab Ali Iba. Significantly, such writings are not alluded to in his autobiography, suggesting perhaps that Ibn Khaldun N saw himself first and foremost as a historian and wanted to be known above all as the author of Kitab Ali Iba. From other sources we know of several other works, primarily composed during the time he spent in North Africa and Al-Andalus. His first book, Luba Bu al muhusal a commentary on the Islamic theology of Fakhr al-Din al-Razi, was written at the age of 19 under the supervision of his teacher al Urobila in Tunis. A work on Sufism, Shifa ul Zail, was composed around 1373 in Fes, Morocco. Whilst at the court of Muhammad V, Sultan of Granada, Ibn Khaldun N composed a work on logic, e al li Sula to the first N. The Kitab al Ibn, Ibn Khaldun N's main work, was originally conceived as a history of the Berbers. Later, the focus was widened so that in its final form, to represent a so called universal history, it is divided into seven books, the first of which, the Mukaddima, can be considered a separate work. Books 2 to 5 cover the history of mankind up to the time of Ibn Khaldun N. Books 6 and 7 cover the history of the Berber peoples and the Mab, which remain invaluable to present day historians, 
as they are based on Ibn Calder N's personal knowledge of the Berbers. Concerning the discipline of sociology, he conceived a theory of social conflict. He developed the dichotomy of sedentary life versus nomadic life as well as the concept of a generation, and the inevitable loss of power that occurs when desert warriors conquer a city. Following a contemporary Arab scholar, Sati al-Husri, the Mukaddimah may be read as a sociological work, six books of general sociology. Topics dealt with in this work include politics, urban life, economics, and knowledge. The work is based around Ibn Khaldun's central concept of AA to the first pound of Iyya, which has been translated as social cohesion, group solidarity, or tribalism. This social cohesion arises spontaneously in tribes and other small kinship groups. It can be intensified and enlarged by a religious ideology. Ibn Khaldun's analysis looks at how this cohesion carries groups to power but contains within itself the seeds a Euro psychological, sociological, economic, political a euro of the group's downfall, to be replaced by a new group, dynasty or empire bound by a stronger cohesion. Ibn Khaldun has been cited as a racist, but his theories on the rise and fall of empires have no racial component, and this reading of his work has been claimed to be the result of mistranslations. Perhaps the most frequently cited observation drawn from Ibn Khaldun ends work is the notion that when a society becomes a great civilization, its high point is followed by a period of decay. This means that the next cohesive group that conquers the diminished civilization is, by comparison, a group of barbarians. Once the barbarians solidify their control over the conquered society, however, they become attracted to its more refined aspects, such as literacy and arts, and either assimilate into or appropriate such cultural practices. Then, eventually, the former barbarians will be conquered by a new set of barbarians, who will repeat the process. Some contemporary readers of Khaldun have read this as an early business cycle theory, though set in the historical circumstances of the mature Islamic empire. Ibn Khaldun outlines an early example of political economy. He describes the economy as being composed of value-adding processes. That is, Labor and skill is added to techniques and crafts and the product is sold at a higher value. He also made the distinction between profit, and sustenance, in modern political economy terms, surplus and that required for the reproduction of classes respectively. He also calls for the creation of a science to explain society and goes on to outline these ideas in his major work The Mukaddimah. Ibn Khaldun also emphasized on the Islamic monetary system that the currency or money should have intrinsic value. And it should be made up of gold and silver that is gold dinar and silver dirham. He also emphasized that the weight and purity of these coins should be strictly followed. As the weight of one dinar should be one might call that is equal the weight of 72 grains of barley and the weight of seven dinar should be equal to weight of 10 dirhams and according to him these coins must be used in laws concerning the charity tax, marriage, fixed legal fines, and other things. Legacy Ibn Khaldun was first brought to the attention of the Western world in 1697, when a biography of him appeared in Buffer copyright Lemmy de Belot de Malainville's Biblio the Kaorian Tale. Ibn Khaldun began gaining more attention from 1806 when Sylvester de Sacy's Trastoma the Arab included his biography together with a translation of parts of the Mukaddimah as the Prolgumna. In 1816, de Sacy again published a biography with a more detailed description on the Prolgumna. More details on impartial translations of the Prolgumna emerged over the years until the complete Arabic edition was published in 1858, followed by a complete French translation a few years later by de Sacy. Since then, the work of Ibn Khaldun has been extensively studied in the Western world with special interest. British historian Arnold J. Toynbee called the Mukaddimah a philosophy of history which is undoubtedly the greatest work of its kind that has ever yet been created by any mind in any time or place. The British philosopher Robert Flint wrote the following on Ibn Khaldun, as a theorist of history he had no equal in any age or country until Vico appeared, more than 300 years later. Plato, Aristotle, and Augustine were not his peers, and all others were unworthy of being even mentioned along with him. Abderrahman Lokshasi writes, 
no historian of the Marab since and particularly of the Berbers can do without his historical contribution. The British philosopher anthropologist Ernest Gelmer considered Ibn Khaldun's definition of government, an institution which prevents injustice other than such as it commits itself, the best in the history of political theory. Egon Arawan, who termed the concept of socialomy, was influenced by Ibn Khaldun's ideas on the evolution of societies. Arthur Laffer, whom the Laffer curve is named after, noted that, among others, some of Ibn Khaldun's ideas precede his own. In 2004, the Tunisian Community Center launched the first Ibn Khaldun Award to recognize a Tunisian-American high achiever whose work reflects Ibn Khaldun's ideas of kinship and solidarity. The award was named after Ibn Khaldun for him being universally acknowledged as the father of sociology and also for the convergence of his ideas with the organization's objectives and programs. In 2006, the Atlas Economic Research Foundation launched an annual essay contest, one, for Muslim students named in Ibn Khaldun's honor. The theme of the contest is, how individuals, think tanks, Universities and entrepreneurs can influence government policies to allow the free market to flourish and improve the lives of his citizens based on Islamic teachings and traditions. In 2006, Spain commemorated the 600th anniversary of the death of Ibn Khaldun. 2. See also Notes and references Notes Citations Bibliography External links equals English equals Ibn Khaldun on in our time at the BBC. Rosenthal, France, 1970 a Euro 80. Ibn Khaldun N. Complete Dictionary of Scientific Biography. Encyclopedia.com. Complete Mukaddimah Kitabal Iba in English, Ibn Khaldun on the web, Ibn Khaldun, His Life and Work, by Muhammad Hosian, Muslim Scientists and Scholars a Euro Ibn Khaldun, Ibn Khaldun N., from Arnold Toynbee, a Study of History Vol. 3. C2. Pages 321, Ibn Khaldun A Euro Unregistered Trademark S Philosophy of Management and Work, Ibn Khaldun, Methodology and Concepts of Economic Sociology, Ibn Khaldun. The Mediterranean in the 14th Century, Rise and Fall of Empires. Andalusian Legacy Exhibition in the Alcazar of Seville, the Ibn Khaldun Community Service Award. Ibn Khaldun meets Al Saud, the Ibn Khaldun Institute. Equals non English equals French, expose a copyright simple if a copyright sur l'author copyright ologie scholastique, chapters from the Mukaddimah and the history of Ibn Khaldun in Arabic, Ismail Kar one quarter peli, Ibn Khaldun und das politische System Syriens a Euro in Jejna one quarter bstlung, ma one quarter nchen. 2007, ISBN 978-3-638-75458-3, Kirk Ian of A.M. Ibn Khaldun Influence on Social Thought Development Lominus of 2013. Moscow, 2013. In Russian.